I joined La Hoi Zhu as one of the first women to be the full-time employee um, at a zoo in Pakistan. And um, that's when I worked with lots of animals, chimpanzees and um, uh, lions. I also reared, hand reared a leopard cub at home, which then I had to give away because it was illegal and obviously I was doing it for a little while. Um, and then um, I, whenever something happened to an animal, I felt a lot of pain. So much so that I thought that I'm unfit to work for animals because I would be crying and howling and it was all, all like, it was craziness and terrible. So I thought to change that pain into an energy to work for animals and you can only get the real satisfaction when you work for animals in the wild in situ and you work for saving their habitats. So although my effort to my advocacy and effort to work for wild animals and their improved welfare continues, but I largely work with animals in, in the wild in situ. And my first break came when I was part of a rescue operation for an Indus River dolphin and what Indus River Dolphin is, is a bullen in the local Sindhi, it's like the vernacular name for the, for the river dolphin. So we uh, traveled to Sakhar and I landed at the airport and we came out of the airport and then after a f like a five minutes drive you see a huge river. So I was like totally excited, I was like look Indus. And the driver corrected me and said, this is a Kirthar canal. And I was amazed that could a canal be so huge like a river? And actually, we all, we, you know that Pakistan has one of the biggest network of irrigation canals because we are largely an irrigation, um, we, we are largely an arid country and has this huge network of canals to irrigate our crop. Now, this, this is how an Indus River looks like. So you, it's, it's massive, it's serene, but these canals which we have for irrigation purposes, they cause a lot of problems for river dolphins and that's precisely why we were there. So we were supposed to rescue a dolphin, which means physically lift it and transport it on a stretcher uh, into the mainstream of the river and release it. We have to do this because otherwise they'll be there in the canals and as the water level drops, they can die because they need water to survive. They are mammals, but they surface out to breathe, but without water, there's no food, nothing for them. That's how an Indus dolphin looks like. They come out of the water to take a breath. Now, when I was in, Sakhar, my first experience of river dolphin, I was sitting by the bank and actually recording the surfacing intervals of river dolphins. So how long do they take to come out of the water to take a breath, okay? So when, um, I noticed that whenever there was disturbance outside the water, they were taking longer. So they would take four minutes underwater, but whenever, the, the river was calm and there was no boat, no fishing activity, no disturbance. They will be more regular, um, there will be more regular surfacing. So which is like a minute and a half to two minutes. Otherwise they'll be underwater for up to four and a half minutes, as I said. So they are, I, I, what I realized was they were so sensitive to their outside environment and they were constantly connected to it. And I found it incredible, amazing. So we have, Indus dolphin is actually one of the only four species of river do dolphins that are found in the world. So we are very blessed to have one of them. Now there are lots of myths and legends attached to the evolution of river dolphins and because this is the mysticism that comes with them and people are, you know, always creating stories. So we had, uh, for, for Yancey, it is known as uh, the goddess of Yancey. It's, um, 
it's for them it's like goddess. And then we have Boto, which is the South American river dolphin. And there the interesting story about Boto is that it comes out of water every night. It becomes a handsome man and <laughs> it uh, comes out and mingles with girls and all these girls fall in love with him and then he impregnates them of all of you know <laughs> on the top of it and then goes back to the river in the end so you know how interesting is that but then indus dolphin has another legend um, and that is that um, she it is about a woman and there was a woman who would bring milk to a saint um, every day and after many years she said nothing doing I'm not doing it anymore and the saint said that you um, are cursed now you go to this river and do push push all your life and this push push sound is the breathing sound of the Indus dolphin because it, it's a mammal it comes out and when it comes out it has a nose on the top of its head so it comes out and it push, it's exhaling so that's that's the story of the Indus river dolphin now but that's we know that this is not true the evolution part is that there was a time which was like 20 million years ago um, the sea water level rose and seawater inundated the river basins and then marine dolphins swam into the rivers gradually the sea level went down again but these dolphins remained stuck in those rivers and gradually evolved to be river dolphins so that's the reality but again this is this is also a hypothesis and we are not sure that probably may, this may not be true. So we had Indus River Dolphin in all the five rivers. Gradually we had water infrastructure that came up, all the barrages and dams which divided the habitat and then they could not move the way they could. That's how a barrage looks like. So it, they became structures that hindered the movement and now the Indus dolphin is only restricted to the mainstream of the Indus. The amazing thing is that you're, you're in Lahore and in the, in the Ravi, like up to 1960s, we had Indus dolphins so close to us. We would have been lucky if they were still there, but there are so many problems. Water infrastructure is just one of those problems. We had water pollution issues. We, we still have them, of course, and we have agriculture pollution, industrial pollution, genetic deterioration. There are many, many things that are happening to Indus River Dolphin. And this just gives an indication that if water quality, water health is not right, then these dolphins are just indicating that it's not right for us either. The fish from that river is not suitable for our consumption either. Now, the biggest problem to uh, river dolphins is that they get entangled in the nets. Gill nets remain a biggest problem for river dolphins. I was once at a social event and I was just talking about river dolphins that an elderly lady came up to me and said, I am so concerned that they can't see and I actually pray that river dolphins get their eyesight back. So I was like, oh, that's, that's amazing and it's a hard thing to hear her say that. But I said, please, just note that this is not a matter of concern for river dolphins because they have very well developed and sophisticated echolocation system, sonar system, like we have in radars. And they produce sounds, these sounds touch their surroundings, come back, they are received, and they know exactly what's there, what size, what shape, what texture. So echolocation is very, 
um, well-developed, sophisticated, they know exactly what's happening around them. But one thing where echolocation also fails is um, Gilnet. Now, Gilnet is like this. Can you see this? Can anyone see this, like from a distance? Not this part, but like this part. So that's how a gillnet looks like. It's so thin. It's made up of nylon. It's thin. It's long. And they are stretched across the river till the bottom. And river dolphins are just attracted to them because there are fish entangled in them as well. And when they come, they bang against them. They try to you know, loosen up, but then they move and they get entangled more and more and they get drowned because again I would stress they are mammals so they have to come out and river dolphins die in fishing nets. In fact, Baiji, which is the Chinese river dolphin, is now extinct and the biggest problem that led to their extinction was gillnet. So when river dolphins die, we do their postmortems, of course. And um, I have seen really tiny shrimp, very tiny, very tiny fish in their stomach. And that's because, again, their echolocation is so sophisticated that they can hunt on very tiny animals. Conservation of river dolphins is very challenging. And it's challenging because the habitat is very tough. It's hot. It's, uh, um, it also has some security issues. But we have been surveying river dolphins every five years, uh, and we know the population trends exactly. So we sit on these high platforms, like six feet high. We sit on them in the sun all day, and we um, do this all day and then camp at night, again all day in camp at night for up to six to eight weeks. And we record dolphins and we know their numbers exactly. So when you come back from the survey, you can look like this. So that's me and that's more like afterwards. Um, we have our boats shot at. We had our teams taken hostage because you have to certain, you know, certain patches where the security situation was very serious, and Indus River is is otherwise extremely serene and it's calming to be on the boat on the river. We want to understand river dolphins more and more, and that's why we put these tags on them to actually know that if they can pass through a barrage or not. Are these barrages physical barriers or actually river dolphins can pass through them? So we, um, this was an animal which we named Musafir. And we found out that Musafir was released, it was released upstream the in, in the Indus, in the Sakhar barrage. And we found that it was going downstream, upstream, so it was, you know, able to move. Um, so it means that there is hope. Barrages still are not physical barriers, and there's still hope for more genetic material uh, flowing through them so that you know, the vigor of a population is maintained. I'm coming to the end, and I'll give you a kind of a summary in a way that um, imagine this you have only 2,000 people left in the world. So it's like probably three, four times the people in this room. So imagine the situation. There would be so much research, so much money coming together to, you know, saving homo sapiens. This is the same emergency situation we have for Indus dolphin because we have to be precise 1987 dolphins left in the Indus now. And this is according to our latest survey which happened last year. So it is an emergency situation. And humans are those species that if we see in terms of biomass, which is the dry carbon weight, we are only one ten thousandth 
of the earth biomass. So we are tiny. But in the last 10,000 years, what we have done is that we have destroyed plants up to 50%. And we have caused extermination of wild mammal species up to 85%, which is terrible. We have the biggest impact. We have to act now. And again, I'll say 20 years ago, when I joined this field of conservation, I was told, you're doing a service. It, you're, it's a service to this planet. But today, the situation is so bad that I think it's an obligation on me, it's an obligation on all of us to contribute and do something. And that's the role that each one of you, each one of us would have to take up, whether you have chosen or not. It's the role that you would have to take up as an obligation and responsibility. Okay, thank you very much.